In the heart of a bustling city, there was a busy street lined with shops and restaurants, filled with the sounds of car horns and the chatter of people. Among the establishments on the street were two very different businesses, a McDonald's restaurant and a small drug operation run by a group of dealers. The McDonald's restaurant was a familiar sight to many people. Its bright yellow and red signs stood out amongst the other buildings on the street, and the smell of freshly cooked fries wafted out onto the sidewalk. Inside, the restaurant was busy with people coming and going, grabbing a quick bite to eat on their way to work or school. Just a few blocks away from the McDonald's restaurant, tucked away in a dimly lit alley, was a small drug operation run by a group of dealers. They were a shady group of people who often lurked around the alleyway, waiting for potential customers to approach them. Despite their differences in appearance, there were some similarities between these two establishments. Both catered to the needs of their customers, albeit in very different ways. McDonald's provided quick and convenient food options to people on the go, while the drug dealers offered a variety of drugs to satisfy their customers' cravings. They also both operated on a supply and demand system. The concept of supply and demand is a fundamental principle in economics, and it applies to businesses of all types. In simple terms, the supply and demand system describes the relationship between the quantity of a product that a business is willing to supply and the quantity of that product that consumers are willing to purchase. In the case of McDonald's, the restaurant must ensure that they have enough food to meet the demand of their customers. Similarly, drug dealers operate on a supply and demand system, although in a much less legal way. The drug dealers must ensure that they have enough product to meet the demand of their clients. So first, let's take a look at the hierarchy of the gang, and the way it is organized. So here's what the org chart of the gang looks like. Now it's amazing but the top level of the gang they actually call themselves the board of directors. It's not like these guys had a very sophisticated kind of view of what happened in American corporate life. But they had seen movies like Wall Street, and they kind of had learned a little bit about what it was like to be in the real world. Now, below that board of directors, you've got essentially what are regional VPs, people who control, say, the south side of Chicago, or the west side of Chicago. But the thing that really makes the gang seem like McDonald's is its franchisees. That the guys who are running, you know, the local gangs the four square block by four square block areas, they're just like the guys, in some sense, who are running the McDonald's. They are the entrepreneurs. They get the exclusive property rights to control the drug selling. They get the name of the gang behind them, for merchandising and marketing. And they're the ones who basically make the profit or lose a profit, depending on how good they are at running the business. Now, the group I really want you to think about are the ones at the bottom, the foot soldiers. These are the teenagers, typically, who'd be standing out on the street corner, selling the drugs. Extremely dangerous work. And important to note that almost all of the weight, all of the people in this organization are at the bottom. So in some sense, the foot soldiers are a lot like the people who are taking your order at McDonald's. And indeed, it's not just by chance that they're like them. In fact, in these neighborhoods, they'd be the same people. So the same kids who were working in the gang were also working part-time at a place like McDonald's. If you manage to rise up and be that local leader, the guy who's the equivalent of the McDonald's franchisee, you'd be making over $100,000 a year. And that, in some ways, was the best job you could hope to get if you were growing up in one of these neighborhoods as a young black male. If you manage to rise to the very top, $200,000 or $400,000 a year is what you'd hope to make. Truly, you would be a great success story. And one of the sad parts of this is that indeed, among the many other ramifications of crack cocaine is that the most talented individuals in these communities, this is what they were striving for. They weren't trying to make it in legitimate ways, because there were no legitimate channels out. This was the best way out. The relationship to McDonald's breaks down here. The money looks about the same, so why is it such a bad job? Well, the reason it's such a bad job is that there's somebody shooting at you a lot of the time. So, with shooting at you, what are the death rates? We found in our gang that this was not really sort of a standard situation, 
This was a time of intense violence of a lot of gang wars as this gang actually became quite successful. But there were costs. And so the death rate, not to mention the rate of being arrested, sent to prison or being wounded, the death rate is 7% per person per year. You're in the gang for four years, you expect to die with about a 25% likelihood. That is about as high as you can get. So for comparison purposes, let's think about some other walk of life where you may expect might be extremely risky. Like let's say that you were a murderer and you were convicted of murder, and you're sent to death row. It turns out, the death rates on death row from all causes, including execution 2% a year. So it's a lot safer being on death row than it is selling drugs out on the street. To give you a sense of just how bad the inner city was during crack and I'm not really focusing on the negatives, but really, there's another story to tell you there if you look at the death rates just of random, young black males growing up in the inner city in the United States the death rates during crack were about 1% that's extremely high. To put it into perspective, if you compare this to the US soldiers in Somalia, for instance, right now fighting against terrorism is 0.3%. So in some very literal way, the young black men who were growing up in this country were living in a war zone, very much in the sense of the way that the soldiers over in Somalia are fighting against terrorism. So why in the world, you might ask, would anybody be willing to stand out on a street corner selling drugs for $8.50 an hour, with a 25% chance of dying over the next four years? Why would they do that? And I think there are a couple answers. I think the first one is that they got fooled by history. It used to be the gang was a rite of passage. That the young people controlled the gang, that as you got older, you dropped out of the gang. So what happened was, the people who happened to be in the right place at the right time the people who happened to be leading the gang in the mid to late 80s became very, very wealthy. And so the logical thing to think was that, well, the next generation so they're going to age out of the gang, like everybody else has, and the next generation is going to take over and get the wealth. So there are striking similarities, I think, to the internet boom, right? The first set of people in Silicon Valley got very rich. And then all of my friends said, maybe I should go do that, too. And they were willing to work very cheap, for stock options that never came. In some sense, that's what happened to the set of people we were looking at, is that they were willing to start at the bottom. Just like a lawyer at a law firm who's willing to start at the bottom, work 80-hour weeks for not that much money, because they think they're going to make partner. But what happened was, the rules changed, and they never got to make partner. Indeed, the same people who were running all of the major gangs in the late 1980s are still running the major gangs in Chicago today. They never passed on any of the wealth. So everybody got stuck at that $8.50 an hour job, and it turned out to be a disaster. The other thing the gang was very good at was marketing and trickery. And so for instance, one thing the gang would do is, the gang leaders would have big entourages, and they'd drive fancy cars and have fancy jewelry but they didn't own those cars. They just leased them because they couldn't afford to own the fancy cars. And they didn't really have gold jewelry they had gold plated jewelry. It goes back to the real real versus the fake real. They did all sorts of things to trick the young people into thinking what a great deal the gang was going to be. So for instance, they would give a 14 year old kid a whole roll of bills to hold. When gang leader get asked, why is it you always get paid, and your workers don't always get paid? His response was, you got all these niggers below you who want your job, if you start taking losses, they see you as weak. And I thought about it, and I said, CEOs often pay themselves million dollar bonuses, even when companies are losing a lot of money. The same things happen for General Motors, McDonald's and other big companies. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more witty matter content.